unmute. Good evening, everybody. Presenting the series of departmental webinar um, from the Department of ENT, Head and Neck Surgery, Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences, Sikkim Manipal University. I welcome all of you to this online webinar and presenting today uh, myself, Dr. Monis Anchetri, Associate Professor from the Department of ENT, Head and Neck Surgery. I'll be having a short presentation on rigid bronchoscopy and insight and our experiences. Coming to the history of rigid bronchoscopy, rigid bronchoscopy in 1897, the first documented rigid bronchoscopy was performed by German otolaryngologist Gustav Killian, who removed an aspirated pork bone. And for a good number of 70 years, this was the only technique available to visualize the airway until a Japanese physicist by the name of Sigeto Ikeda in 1967, that is 70 years later, developed the flexible bronchoscope, a prototype of which he is holding here, and then started the advent of flexible bronchoscopy. Today's rodless telescope is developed by Harold Hopkins in England, and this is the basic telescope that we insert through our rigid bronchoscope. Over the years, Carl Storrs has modified this technology with cold illumination and uh, rigid bronchoscope nowadays are mostly of the Storrs type since the 1950s. Coming to the preoperative assessment of a rigid bronchoscopic case, rigid bronchoscopy is almost exclusively performed under deep sedation or general anesthesia and this requires a standard preoperative assessment. We need to pay special attention to the oral cavity, jaw and neck mobility, and all basic tests are essential for the patient. The anesthetist at his discretion may ask for any additional test depending on the patient's medical history. When do we do a rigid bronchitis? Bronchoscopy and what are that means what are the indications for rigid bronchoscopy? One of the most important indications for a rigid bronchoscopy is for hemostasis in hemoptysis and removing blood clots. And another equally important is foreign body retrievals. Uh, we can use it for deeper tissue biopsy specimen where flexible bronchoscopy does not give us proper results. It can be used for dilation of the airway strictures and relief of airway obstructions for insertion of airway stents. And we can do various endoluminal therapies such as laser treatment or argon plasma coagulation, or we can debride certain interluminal pathologies via a rigid bronchoscope. As an argumentary for investigation also, we can use it in combination with other modalities such as for thin slice CT scans, etc. The absolute contraindication for a rigid bronchoscopy would be uncontrolled coagulopathy and extreme ventilatory or oxygenation demands of the patient. And a relative contraindication would be for a novice operator or uh, tracheal obstruction in which there may be a further problem where expertise is not present. Injury to the teeth and gums are common complications that can arise, but se severe complications such as tracheal or bronchial tears or severe bleeding can also occur sometimes. There are certain factors that may complicate rigid bronchoscopy and make the procedure difficult to perform, an unstable cervical spine or a diminished range of motion of the cervical spine as in spondylysis. <clears throat> in this one, since we need to have a hyperextension of the neck in rigid bronchoscopy, it becomes difficult. Uh, maxillofacial traumas or oral diseases may prevent opening of the jaw to admit the bronchoscope and it may become difficult to do. 
Similarly, laryngeal diseases such as stenosis or obstructing neoplasms may prevent uh, passage of the scope and may cause further trauma, hence become, uh, hence complicate rigid bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy is a special procedure because the ventilation of the patient is dependent via the procedure and hence many types of ventilation methods are developed and used of importance of historical importance the apneic oxygenation method then spontaneous assisted ventilation mostly we are doing spontaneous assisted ventilation and controlled closed system ventilation these days and in some difficult cases we might resort to a manual z ventilation or a high frequency z ventilation it also depends on the procedure the anesthesis is conversant with so we have to decide pre-decide on what method we are going to use while we are going to do the bronchoscopy so coming to how do we set up the instrument and what are the parts of the, what are the various instruments that are used for this procedure i have taken a video from John Radcliffe Hospital, Oxford, where I'll be trying to explain what are the uh, different instruments used. So the assembled setup. So how do we assemble a bronchoscope, a rigid bronchoscope, and what are the parts of a rigid bronchoscope? So courtesy of the video is the John Radcliffe Hospital, Oxford, and it is a series of their educational videos. Uh, we have optical grass.
Aí, aí. Aqui não me serve a minha escrita. Aí, né? Technical glitch and we are back uh, discussing. We were discussing the advantages and disadvantages of flexible versus rigid bronchoscopy. So the major disadvantage of a flexible bronchoscope is that it does not provide a secure airway and it cannot protect from sharp objects. And especially it cannot protect from objects when they are transiting the glottis. So removal of foreign bodies, any uneven foreign body, it becomes very risky using a flexible bronchoscopy. Uh, whereas well, we are doing with a rigid bronchoscopy, although it is not available widely and it requires a higher level of training and mostly requires general anesthesia, this provides a very stable airway and then we will be better able to manage central airway and aspiracting foreign bodies. Plus, we can also protect the sharp objects by seeding it with the barrel and we can remove objects or foreign bodies without lo losing the airway. Plus, an uh, armamentarium of tools are available, including grasping tools, biopsy, deep biopsy tools and all. And moreover, if we need to do a flexible bronchoscopy, we can always do a flexible bronchoscopy through a rigid bronchoscope. Hence, mostly for foreign bodies and deeper tissue biopsies and all, we would prefer to have a rigid bronchoscopy. And now coming to some of our experiences with uh, rigid bronchoscopy in Central Rifle Hospital. I have a couple of cases here that we have done in the last one or two years. The first one was a 12 year old boy who had accidentally swallowed a cap of a toy in a candy. So he had a peculiar whistling type of noisy breathing which alerted the parents and they presented to a pediatrician. Actually, the pediatrician called me up and then they had a strong suspe suspicion of a bronchus foreign body. So we asked them to present to the hospital and the there was a wheeze kind of thing due to decrease air entry. So the child was brought to emergency and we did an ENT evaluation. The, since the cap that was adherently swallowed was made up of plastic, it was not visible in X-ray. And we resorted to a CT scan, which also could not properly localize the radiolucent foreign body. And, but there was a doubtful shadow in the lower right bronchus. And the clinical picture was of that side only. Since there was strong positive history and clinical correlation, uh, of the swallowing of a foreign body, we counseled the parent for the need of a diagnostic bronchoscopy and patient was posted for emergency rigid bronchoscopy under general anesthesia by our department. Uh, we could localize the foreign body in the lower right bronchus and it was successfully extracted under ventilating bronchoscope by using an optical forceps. The child recovered uneventfully. So this is an intraluminal appearance of the foreign body through the optical forceps. And this is how we hold it and we removed it through the limb. And this was the foreign body that was removed after the procedure. Uh, second case, we had a 10 year old child who was referred to a hospital with a history of swallowing a nail. When we did a CT scan, we found that the nail had rather gone into the bronchus than not into the esophagus. And it was found to be in the left bronchus end in X-ray and then it was confirmed with CT scan and we could localize it somewhere around the end of the left lower bronchus. So we had planned a um, rigid bronchoscopy and we did emergency rigid bronchoscopy. And while doing the procedure, when I could see the nail, I could see there was something else along with the nail which was not previously seen. So whereas the nail was facing upwards and I could see the nail. I could see that along when I trying to remove the nail, there was some other part. So the foreign body, which was initially thought to be a nail by imaging, it was actually a tack pin with a big blue radiolucent plastic part, which was obstructing the lumen of the bronchus. And this was identified during bronchoscopy only. So this one did not fit through the bronchoscope. Since it was a pediatric patient, the bronchoscope, it did not fit through the bronchoscope. So we seeded the sharp part and we removed the other part along with the bronchoscope. A check bronchoscopy was done and it was found to be good. So this was what was removed. And another case, this one is a recent one. Uh, I think last month we had a patient who was referred from district hospital with an X-ray diagnosis of bronchiectasis for a week, a symptoms for a week. And when we take the history very properly, he gives a history of aspirating erica knot 
which was followed by violent bout of cough. So we, a CT scan of the thorax showed a radio opaque luminal opacity of Houston unit 185 in the left bronchus. So he was planned for rigid bronchoscopy and we did a rigid bronchoscopy since uh, <clears throat> it was an adult patient. We did the awake intubation with cooperation from the patient and uh, expert anesthesia. We did the awake intubation with ventilating bronchoscope and we did not have optical forceps for adults. So we removed it with a normal forceps and it was successfully removed. So the, this was a piece of supari that is Eric Arnott. So the patient recovered uh, over the next one week. So coming to the end of the presentation, what we have to keep it in mind is post procedural after a rigid bronchoscopy, the chances of complications are quite severe and serious complications can occur. And also there are chances of leaving a foreign body behind. So always perform a repeat airway survey, especially after foreign bodies. A full airway survey should be completed to assess for additional foreign bodies, which are identified in three to six percent of patients. And we need to review the area in which the foreign body was lost so that we can see if there's any retained fragments of the original foreign body, if there's any bronchial stenosis, granulation tissue or bleeding. And usually this presents presenting to a tertiary care center are presenting after a week or so. So after some time, usually they develop complications such as bronchiectasis and infections and abscess and all those things. So if possible, if mucopurulent or purulent secretions are present when removing the foreign body, then we can collect those for culture. So these are some of the silent features of a rigid bronchoscopy and some of the cases we have done here. Thank you all.